We're looking at Revelation 5 this morning. I have been doing a series in the evening service on the book of Revelation. The first three chapters take place in the first century, where John writes to seven churches that exist right then. And he has a burden for each one of those churches, and they did relate to us. And we've studied those together. When you get to Revelation chapter 4 and 5, you come to an interlude. It's an interlude where John steps back, is called up by God to heaven, and he watches worship as it takes place in the throne room of God. He tells us in that worship service about an experience that he had of seeing a scroll in the hand of God. It was a scroll that was sealed with seven seals. It was a scroll that had been sealed... If you read Daniel chapter 12, it is a scroll that was sealed since the time of Daniel. Where God revealed to Daniel some of the things that would take place in the future, even our future. And when Daniel said, tell me more about these things, in Daniel chapter 12, the Lord said, no, it's been sealed up until the end of time. Now, John sees that scroll, and he wants to know what's in it, as I'm sure you do. And there isn't anybody who's worthy to open the scroll. And so he begins to weep and weep and weep, and one of the 24 elders walked over to him and said, Don't weep. The Lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy to open the seal. The line of the tribe of Judah, of course, was Jesus Christ, going back to a prophecy in Genesis chapter 49, where there was going to be a lion that was going to come out of the tribe of Judah, and he was going to be given a scepter, and the scepter would never be taken away from him. And because he triumphed as the lion of Judah, he was worthy to open the seals. Now, the most amazing thing happens. John turns to look at the lion, and instead... He sees a lamb. Verse 6, Revelation 5. I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them to be a kingdom and priests, to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Well, then I looked, and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000, and they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard... Every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down in worship. This ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us bow together in prayer. Father, we ask now that you would open up our eyes to see your glory and your power and your majesty, that we might worship you and long to worship you as we ought. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. Those were Liz's words to me when I showed her this old junker that I wanted to buy for $600. I thought it was a great deal. She said, look at how many miles it has on it, over 100,000 miles. Look at what it looks like. It's falling apart. It's just not worth it. That phrase, 
It's not worth it. Really guides us so many times in what is our priority and what we're going to do, does it not? We make decisions on what we're going to do on the basis of whether it is worth it or not. There was a businessman, I was reading an article by a businessman in Jim Dobson's latest Folks on the Family. And that businessman has been wrestling with the balance of the family and the business and church and so on. And he made this observation. He said, if you were ever offered a promotion, he said, I recognize it will mean more money and so on. But he said, many, many times, promotions will also be more demanding on you, take you out of town more, cause you to work more hours. And he says, before you take any promotion, ask yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth it? It's a question that governs what we do and how we act. There was an elderly man one time in his 70s who had been struggling with cancer for a number of years. But in the last few months, he had been getting very, very bad. And he had chemotherapy once a month. Now, chemotherapy, he would get for a week. And after a week with chemotherapy, the next week was just awful. But the chemotherapy was designed to kill the cancer cells and preserve his life. I talked to him on one occasion, and I said, is, is this the week that you're going to get the chemotherapy again? And he said, I'm scheduled for it. But he said, I know that I don't have too much longer. And to get chemotherapy now, it's just not worth it. That question, is it worth it, governs our choices, governs our priorities, makes us decide what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. Teenager was sitting at home watching TV. His parents were getting ready for church. They turned to him and said, aren't you going to church with us today? And he said, Mom, you don't understand. Sitting there for an hour and a half, when I could be doing all sorts of other things, it's just not worth it. And I ask you this morning as we sit here and worship, is it worth it? Or should I say, is he worth it? John introduces to us in Revelation chapter 5, 24 elders, four very unusual looking creatures, millions of angels, and people from every language and tribe and nation under heaven, all of whom confidently affirm that he is worth it. That he is worthy. He is worthy of our worship. The word worship itself is derived from the word worthy. In fact, it means worthy ship. Ship is a suffix that's added to many things like lordship, friendship, township. It's a suffix. But the word worship comes from the word worthy. And worship is reflecting the radiance of His worth. Now today, I don't know why you're here. Some of you are here because you understand His worth. And you are drawn by recognition of His worth and you have come to express to Him that He is worthy. There are others of you who are here today who know of people that have this amazing love for Jesus Christ. He has changed their life and you don't quite understand it. And you're here today because you want to explore this, who this person is that has so radically changed a life someone else. There are others of you who are here today because you have to be. You feel it a duty of some sort, either a duty to your parents or maybe even a duty to God that because He's God, I have to be here and I have to worship Him. You alone know this morning why you're here. But I want you to think about it. John gives us two reasons in this picture in Revelation chapter 5 of why Jesus Christ is worthy. What he does is gives us a glimpse of worship in heaven. And worship in heaven is perfect. It is fully enjoyed, so much so that the elders are worshiping him day and night. Full enjoyment. And what is taking place there gives us a glimpse of what worship ought to be here on earth. The one reason that the Lord is worthy to be worshipped is that He has created all things. Look at verse 11 of chapter 4. 
You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You are worth it, John says. Think of the wonder of creation. We're told that if you go out on a night, you're able to see 8,000 stars. That is, if you're able to see the stars in the day and the night in the northern and southern hemisphere. 8,000 stars, only 4,000 in the northern hemisphere, 4,000 in the southern hemisphere. And of those 4,000 stars you're able to see, there are only 2,000 you can see at night. The other 2,000 you can only see at day if there wasn't the sun. So in a given night, when you stand there and look at the expanse in the heavens and get overwhelmed at the number of stars, you're seeing at most 2,000. God has created just in the stars in our Milky Way galaxy, hundreds of billions of stars. And he has created millions of galaxies. And the closest star to us, other than the sun itself, is 25 trillion miles away. It takes 4.3 light years to get there. And a light year is how many miles it takes for light to travel in a year. And whenever you stop and think just for a moment of the immensity of the heavens and what God has created and all of that and more, then you can begin to realize how awesome God really is. That's why the elders spontaneously, without a thought, fall down in reverent adoration, reflecting back to God the radiance of His worth in verse 10. Look what it says. The 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne, and they worship Him who lives forever and ever. Very much like David, who in Psalm 8 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is Your name in all the earth. You have set Your glory above the heavens, and when I consider the stars the heavens and the moon that you've set in place. What is man that you're mindful of him? When David thought of the heavens and the glory of God, he felt so incredibly insignificant. He asked the question, who am I? And he was lost in wonder, love, and praise. There's a second spontaneous act of worship in heaven which reflects back to God the radiance of his worth because he's the creator. Look at the last part of verse 10. The elders not only fell down before him in reverence, but they also laid their crowns before the throne. What they're doing is laying their treasures before him. It's an act of worship, spontaneous act of worship. It reminds me of David, if you look back with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. When David thought of the wonder, and the majesty of God the Creator, 1 Chronicles, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, the Old Testament. David was so overwhelmed at the greatness and the majesty and the power of God, he automatically responded in one way. Look at this, verse 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is a kingdom. You're exalted as head over everything. Wealth and honor come from you. You're the ruler of all things. And in your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. And now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only that which comes from your hand when he recognized the glory and the power of his creator, the majesty and his greatness, he spontaneously responded by giving of his wealth to the Lord. David asked the question, who am I, in Psalm 8. David asked the question in 1 Chronicles 29, who am I? You look at the greatness of God and we realize how insignificant we are. Now I ask you this morning, are you moved to awe and wonder when you contemplate the greatness and the glory of God? Does it fill you with pleasure and delight to reflect on the radiance of His worth in your giving and in your reverence before God? 
Is that awe and wonder there? C.S. Lewis, in the comment that he makes in his book on the Psalms, wrote this. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and sex and selfish ambition, thinking there we find joy and happiness, when infinite joy is offered to us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. John Piper goes on in response by saying, that's it. The enemy of worship is not that our desire for pleasure is too strong. The enemy of worship is that our desire for real pleasure is too weak. We've settled for a home and a family and a few friends and a job and a television and a microwave and an occasional night out and a yearly vacation and perhaps a new personal computer. And we've accustomed ourselves to such meager, short-lived pleasures that our capacity for joy has shriveled up and so our worship has shriveled up as well. Many can scarcely imagine what is meant by a holiday at the sea, which is worshiping the living God. And so worship services across our land bear the scars of this process. For many, Christianity has become the grinding out of general doctrinal laws from collections of biblical facts. But the childlike wonder and awe of His majesty have all but died. The scenery, the poetry, the music of the majesty of God has dried up before our very eyes like a forgotten peach in the back of your refrigerator. Has awe and wonder dried up in your life? Are you moved when you think of His majesty and His glory? Quite frankly, it's one of the reasons why I get excited about our new church. We as human beings need things which will help us to be reminded of His honor and His glory and His majesty. You go into cathedrals in England to see the loftiness, the spaciousness which remind us of the grandeur of God isn't quite as much captured in a place like this. But the glory will be to worship in a sanctuary that reminds us of the greatness and the majesty. And my prayer is that every single one of us will be able to recapture that childlike awe and wonder, the greatness of our God. But there is a second reason that He's worthy. He is worthy because He redeemed us. Look at verse 9. Here's another song they sang. This is a new song. You're worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. With this, the imagery moves to the marketplace where slaves are being bought and sold, where slaves are chained to the floor. They cannot get away. They have no freedom. And while you were in that marketplace and every single one of us was chained there, each one of us has been auctioned on the auction block, sold as a slave to sin with no means of escape, no means of freedom. We've been offered time and time again to a cheap and thoughtless crowd. While we were there, one day, the Master came. Jesus Christ came, and though there were many slaves, He walked up to you. He walked up to you. He chose to walk up to you and to purchase you. Not because of anything that you had done, not because you were a great slave, not because of your beauty or your wealth or your talents. He just walked up and he bought you. And he bought you with the highest price that could be paid. He bought you, the Bible says in verse 10, verse 9, he bought you with his blood. He bought you when He shed His blood on the cross of Calvary to pay the penalty for your sin. And then He said, 
your mind. I want you to notice as you look here at verse 9, that when He shed His blood, Christian, it was for you. It was for you in particular. It was with you in mind. It was with your name in mind that Jesus Christ shed His blood. It does not say in verse 9 that His blood made men purchasable. Do you understand that? If Jesus died for everybody in the same way, then the Bible would have to say that He died to make men redeemable, that He died to make men purchasable, that He died to make men forgivable, and it was sort of open and equal for everybody. And that is not what the Scripture says anywhere. He did not die to make you purchasable. He died to purchase you individually. By name. And when you think of that, you have to be overwhelmed. Many times as I teach the doctrine of the sovereignty of God, I'm asked the question, why in the world does God do that? If you look with me for a moment at Romans chapter 9, there's a passage of Scripture that I cannot ever talk about and point out without getting chills up and down my spine, and many times tears come to my eyes. People will say, well, if God is sovereign, He's chosen some people from before the foundation of the world. He's chosen them in love, and He's going to take them to be with Him for all eternity. Why does God do that? It doesn't sound fair. Paul in Romans 9 deals with the question of fairness. He, he says in verse 14, what should we say then? Is God unjust? Not at all. God is not unfair to do that. But he also deals with the question of why. Why would he choose an individual? He says in verse 22, he sits down with us and he says, okay, I know you're wrestling with this. I know you don't understand why he would choose you. I don't know. I know you wrestled with why he would die just for you. But what if He did this? Verse 22. What if God, choosing to show His wrath and make His power known, what, just, what if He bore with great patience the objects of His wrath prepared for destruction? What if He did this in order to make the riches of His glory known to the objects of His mercy who He prepared in advance for glory, even us? What if He did it for you? What if He did it just so you could fully understand His mercy and His grace? What if He did it just for you? Does that not overwhelm you? Does that not make you fall on your knees as the elder did to want to give to Him the honor and glory and praise? It did for my life. I grew up in a church that did not teach me that. I grew up in a church that taught me that I chose Jesus Christ and Jesus was real happy that I did. And all my life up to that point, I lived for myself because Jesus was just glad I was going to be in heaven with Him. And then I went to this strange college in Lookout Mountain, Tennessee called Covenant College and I roomed with a pre-ministerial student who spent many hours deep into the night telling me that God is sovereign and He chose me before the foundation of the world to love Him. And I wrestled with that. And I wrestled for years. Until one day God's Spirit revealed to me the truth of that and it changed my life. To where when I finally understood that, I no longer considered God fortunate to have me on His team. But I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed and continue to be overwhelmed at why God chose me. And it is my desire now that my life and my words be a praise to Him. He went to where you were standing, Christian. Slaves chained to sin and He bought you with His blood and He touched you with His hand. Myra Brooks wrote this poem about that that gives a glimpse. It was battered and scarred and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time with that old violin. But he held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folk, he cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, and two, only two. Two dollars, and who'll make it three? Going for three, but no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man came up forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from that old violin and tightening the loosened strings, he played a melody pure and sweet as a caroling angel sings. 
the music ceased. And the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, Now, what am I bid for that old violin? And he held it up with a bow. A thousand dollars? And who will make it two? Two thousand, who will make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and gone, cried he. And the people cheered, but some of them cried. We don't understand. What changed its worth? Quick came the reply. It was a touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like that old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of the soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. He is worthy because he purchased you. And he purchased men and women, it says here in Revelation, from every tribe and language and nation under heaven. He is worthy. And that is why, again, spontaneously, the 24 elders fall down, according to verse 8, they fell down before the Lamb in reverence, in worship. He is worthy. They are reflecting the radiance of His worth. And they have two things in their hands. One you'll notice in verse 8. Each of them was holding a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Incense is like perfume, and you know what pr fragrant perfume likes and what delight it brings. Your prayers are fragrant incense going up to God that brings Him delight and pleasure. I think of the times we pray in worship as an integral part of worship and reflecting His glory and His worth. Do you pray along? Or is your mind wandering in other things? Let your prayers be part of that incense that goes up to God. But you notice the second thing they're holding on to. The elders are also holding on to a harp. And music is God's gift to us to enable us to reflect His worth. Listen to the song that accompanied, that they accompanied with their harp. It's found in verses 11 and 12. It says, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Can you picture that scene taking place? Millions of angels gathered around singing in a loud voice, not like we so often do, sort of whispering under our breath, singing majestically. A few years ago, we were in Washington, D.C., and we were at a conference there, and the conference closed with 5,000 people all singing the Hallelujah Chorus. And when it was over, nobody moved. We were all caught in such a wonder and praise of the majesty of God. That is what music is designed to do. Again, I'm so excited about thinking of being able to go to our new church and to be able to worship with seven, eight, nine hundred people to praise God. There's a purpose in that. To gather people in a loud voice to offer God in music the honor and glory and praise that's due to His name. But look at the song a moment. In verse 12, what does it mean? when it says he's worthy to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. It doesn't mean that we can give that to him. We can't add anything to him. So what does it mean? What verse 12 shows us is what I've been trying to say, that worship is reflecting the radiance of his glory. When you see His glory and understand His glory, it is simply your heart being a mirror reflecting that glory back to Him. You can't give Him power. You can't give Him praise. You can't give Him wisdom. But He already is all those things. In fact, in Psalm 96, the Lord says, Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. The word ascribe means to acknowledge it, to credit Him as having those. 
That's what worship is. It is crediting God as having power and honor and glory and praise. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21-25, right there it says, Jesus Christ is our wisdom. He is our power. And in 1 Chronicles 29 that we read before, it tells us that He is the one who is majestic. He is the one who is glorious. He is the one who is powerful. He is the one who has all strength and all wealth. Our praise simply reflects the wonder of His glory. Verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive the power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Those are just the words. But it says here in verse 12 that they were singing it. And that's where the music comes in. Music is written in order to touch our hearts as well as our minds. It's so easy for us, I think, many times to just let our minds be involved in worship. But worship is a matter of the heart as well as the head. It's a matter of theology as well as doxology. Worship is a matter of emotion as well as thought. It's a matter of affection as well as reflection. It takes the mind as well as the heart. John Piper, writing about worship, says, Truth without emotion produces dead orthodoxy in a church that is full of artificial admirers like people who write generic anniversary cards for a living. Have you ever thought about doing that? People sit down and write these cards. Oh, how I love you, sweetheart, and all these things. They don't know who they're writing to. And when we have worship that is only of the mind and devoid of emotion, we are writing to God. Generic anniversary card. Devoid of meaning. On the other hand, emotion without, without truth produces an empty frenzy and cultivates shallow people who refuse the disciplines of rigorous thought. There are a lot of churches like that too. Just get caught up and worked up in an emotion, but don't understand the importance of truth. True worship, Piper goes on to say, comes from people who are deeply emotional and who love the deep sound doctrines because strong affections for God that are rooted in truth are the bone and marrow of any biblical worship. I want to challenge you on that. Because I think if there's any fault that we have, it is worshiping primarily intellectually. And I think there are many of us who want a straight arm emotion when it comes to worship. Do you know why? It's safer that way. It's safer to worship just intellectually, to walk in and out of church unchanged, unmoved, to go through the motions of opening up the hymn book and giving an offering and listening to a sermon. It's safe to do that. And we board up our hearts. Because once the head and the heart are involved in worship, you make yourself vulnerable to the Spirit of God coming into you and changing your life. Because I tell you from experience, when you worship with head and heart, you do not walk out of the worship service as the same person. There's a real danger that we have in a kind of worship that only lets the mind worship. It's a danger that Jesus speaks about when He quotes Isaiah. He said to the Jews, These people come near Me with their mouth, they honor Me with their lips, but their hearts are far from Me, and they worship Me in vain. Your worship is going to be in vain if you try to worship Him only with the mind. Again, John Piper writes, Worship is a way of gladly reflecting back to God the radiance of His worth. It's not a mere act of willpower by which we perform outward acts of worship. For without the engagement of the heart, we don't really worship at all. We only perform a duty. This summer, Liz and I are going to be celebrating our 17th wedding anniversary. And on that night of our wedding anniversary, if I came home and I brought 12 long stemmed roses, presented them to her, and she looked at me and she said, Oh, Rodney, I can't believe you gave me this. And 
she gives me a big hug and she kisses me and she's so overwhelmed. And I look at her and very nonchalantly say, hey, don't make a big deal of it. It's my duty. <laughs> what would that say? What would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. No, I won't tell you what would happen. <laughs> Because beautiful roses are a contradiction in terms. And if I'm not moved by a spontaneous affection for her as a person, the roses don't honor her. In fact, they belittle her. They're a very thin covering for the fact that she does not have the worth or the beauty in my eye to kindle true affection in my heart. And all I can do is muster up a calculated expression of marital duty. On the other hand, if I take Liz out on that evening to dinner, and we spend that evening together, and in the midst of the evening she says, Why are you doing this? If my answer, the answer that would truly honor her, would be an answer that says, I'm doing this because there's nothing that makes me happier tonight than to be with you. When it comes to worship, if my answer as to why I'm here is, it's my duty, it doesn't honor God. At best, it's a generic anniversary card saying, I love you. But if your answer is, I am here because it's my joy, that is an honor to Him. In our worship, C.S. Lewis again, as he was thinking on this, meditated on it. He said, the most obvious fact about praise, whether of God or anything, strangely escaped me for years. For I thought of it in terms of compliment or approval or giving honor. I never noticed that all my enjoyment spontaneously overflows in the praise the world rings with praise. Readers of their favorite poet, walkers praising the countryside, players praising their favorite game, praise of weather, dishes, actors, motors, horses, colleges, countries, historical personages, children, flowers, mountains, rare stamps, beetles, anything. We praise. And I had not noticed either that just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge others to join them in praising it by saying, isn't she lovely? Isn't this glorious? Don't you think this is magnificent? The psalmist in telling everyone to praise God is doing what all men do when they speak about what they care for the most. When you're looking at worship, you're looking at the question of what has your affection what do you care for the most? What do you value the most? What is worth it to you? Do you see Jesus Christ who made you and redeemed you as worth it? He's worth your praise. He is worth your life. He is worth everything that you can offer. Let us pray. Forgive us, O Lord, for the many times in which we have worshipped you half-heartedly. For the times in which we've worshipped you in vain. For the times in which we tried to worship you just with our mind and not with our hearts. O oh God, I pray that through reflection upon your majesty and the wonders of your heaven and the music that you give us, that you would stir our affections for you, that the mere thought of worship would make us come running and longing for those moments with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.